Welcome everyone. Today we have beautiful Rachel Rama joining us today. Rachel is a courageous survivor of satanic ritual abuse and mind control. She was born into a Mormon family of generational Satanists. And if you missed our incredible interview, an expose of the Mormon cult last time, I just wanted to introduce some of the incredible solutions that she's creating for survivors at this time. So she is the author of several books, including Letters to the Bridegroom, The Girl Raised by Angels, and The Brokenhearted Captive. Today, Rachel is a courageous prayer warrior. She is a reverend and a pastor. And if you caught up with us for her last interview, it was just incredibly vulnerable, raw and powerful, and just such a huge expose of the Mormon cult operations. And, you know, I have so much, you know, respect for survivors like you, Rachel, because it's it's not easy speaking out against these huge international communities and in this case a religious group and you know particularly when these groups have really deceived the masses so effectively and I know for survivors it's often the people that are still indoctrinated and brainwashed into these religious institutions themselves that are the ones that lash out and often attack survivors so I just I thank you so much for your bravery and I know that there's since we did that interview like just a few weeks ago, there's actually been a few new survivors of both the Latter-day Saints Church and the Mormons that have, have reached out. So it's beautiful that, you know, by sharing your story, it's giving others that that courage to begin healing as well. So I love that. I love how just every story coming forward is is helping other survivors out there. So it's incredible. And I know today we were we were deciding on what to talk about and Rachel's going to share some you know, incredible information about how the trauma of other children in rituals is used to program the, the children being programmed at that time. And, um, you know, these are some of the hardest memories for survivors to process. Like I know, I know for myself, as I've been remembering over the last few years, the memories that have really floored me have not been the memories that have, you know, I've, I've remembered my own abuse because, you know, when we've lived through that, there's places and parts and, you know, our minds so set up to literally handle that pain. Sometimes it's kind of like you can almost be quite numb and, and blank about it when it's yourself. But when you actually watch in a memory other children being hurt, other children being abused, and in, in many cases, other children being sacrificed, it's such a horrific memory to recollect. So I just want to put a little warning out there today. We are going to be talking about some, you know, really horrific programming. So if you feel this is going to trigger you, you know, it's a good one to, to sit down and watch with a friend or watch with, you know, your counsellor or make sure that you've got someone someone here to support. We're not discussing this today to, you know, give any glory at all to the enemy's kingdom. This is about us discussing what these cults do to traumatize children and program them and Rachel's going to give us also an incredible overview of how we're able to heal those soul wounds and how we're able to actually you know come to God and you know have this beautiful healing with him to to move through you know these kind of unthinkable traumas and I think you're such a, a brilliant example of that Rachel with everything that you've experienced and, you know, for you to be out there as a survivor now healing others. And, you know, we'll talk about later as well. Rachel's got an incredible daily prayer at the moment for survivors of satanic ritual abuse and, and child trafficking on her YouTube. And she has an event coming up in January for deliverance. And I think that's such a beautiful solution for survivors as well. So we're, we're so grateful for everything you're do, doing, Rachel, and it's lovely to have you back. How are you? Oh, man, I it's been amazing what the Lord's done since the last interview aired just a few weeks ago. I think it was only a month ago we reported it. And, um, you know, there was that initial, like, reactionary, retaliatory spiritual warfare from the enemy for being that voice. But I remember like how profound it was for me when I was at a place of healing to find other voices and how profound that was 
to be like, I'm not the only one. Because one of the tactics that they use is to create, you know, there's no true and healthy connection. It's all, you know, operating through a family dynamic of trauma bonds and gaslighting and, and things like that. And so there's not genuine connection with other individuals. And that's part of how the programming is able to come in is through broken relationships that God created us and intended for us to know and be able to have with each other. And so when they like distort those relationships and turn it into a wound, they they can fill that space of the soul realm and, and aspects of the flesh with, with the enemy's agenda in some capacity. It's, so it's such an isolative society that we live in at this point regardless of whether you've been through satanic ritual abuse or not we live in the society is meant to create these falsities of connection and you know social media and likes and shares and comments and things like that and we we've lost genuine human connection where sometimes you need someone to sit with you and not say anything those have been some of the most profound moments with friends that i've had is in a deep place of something within healing or sorrow, you know, whatever it is. And just having someone sit with me, not have to say the right words, not have to, you know, say the right prayer, not have to fix it, but just wit witness me in that moment. And we have lost so largely in our society. We, we have lost that because we always reach for something else to fill those broken places, whether it's, you know, um, medications or drugs and alcohol, relationships, you know, immorality. And those are all, you know, we reach for the sin until we reach for his hand. And so, you know, that's just where our society, our world is at. It's not where we're staying. It's where we're at. Um, God is too good to let us stay in that and he's moving quite powerfully in lives like you and i to really be this 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 cry from the wall and watchtower to bring healing to others so because it's in learning how how do we let god into those places how do i let the blood of jesus cleanse those places and there's different ways to pray you know, it's not the the pleading prayers of like, God, I need help right now. I need you to fix this right now with the intimacy and learning, having your identity restored through the blood of Jesus. And then from that place of knowing that I am a daughter of the most high God, beginning to walk in authority, walk in his authority and speak his name over things. And so, um, yeah, so last week's been great. Uh <laughs> That's Last amazing. few weeks have been really good. Uh, God is lining things up and making adjustments and, and adding now to, um, you know, like the daily prayer on YouTube and doing a live prophetic prayer ministry to where my face is the only one exposed and anyone can come in and have that safety still on the other side of their screen and not have to expose themselves but still just be praying live as Holy Spirit leads. And, and, and I think what a beautiful witness of the father's heart that all of these things that the enemy has created and these platforms that the enemy created <laughs> for his agenda. And God's like, ah, no. Yeah. That listens so clearly to his voice. And the Lord said to do this and I'm, you know, figuring out how I'll do it. And in prayer, and I'm like, well, you know, I can go live on YouTube mm -hmm. and Holy Spirit will still tell me what to pray. God is who taught me how to pray. Holy Spirit was my teacher because the church has bought into a lot of the lies of this agenda of, of pride and entitlement and things like that. That's not necessarily like new age spirituality, but it's absolutely falsities and lies of the world that we're saying is an aspect of Christianity, especially I know in America with like prosperity gospel, if you pay a tithing, God will let. And so tithing has become like a deposit on your inheritance. And that's not at all what, you know, the first mention of tithing is Abraham rescuing women and children in battle when he rescues Lot. And he takes all of the claimed gold to the high priest Melchizedek, who's a foreshadow of Jesus 
and gives him 10% of that and then wouldn't touch anymore. It was a cleansing. Tithing is when we pay a tithe, it cleanses us from the demonic root of finances in the world. And then we're, we're operating in kingdom faith with our finances instead of worldly accounting and financial aspects. And so, but I don't know where I was going with that. I wanted to talk about what we had talked about was, was the, the, the wounds of, of when they intentionally hurt another child or intentionally bring another child into the same ritual for further abuse and force children to watch that. And so there's kind of three different aspects um, from my experiences that they would use to, to do that with. And so there's the one where they're traumatizing a child um, to make an example of that child's behavior. So if they have an incredibly strong-willed and defiant child, they will ostracize that child in a family dynamic or in whatever dynamic of group mentality that child is around, they'll ostracize that child and make an example of that child so that everyone else knows to not be defiant and strong-willed. So even if they cannot break that child in their attempts to break that child, they make a public display. That was a lot of like the military mind control traumas. Um, and then there's um, the other aspect is when a child is brought in and it's um, you both experience and witness the other experience the same trauma. And that's the twinning traumas that we hear about with mind control as well is when two children, so if programming is not sticking in one child, their next kind of is trying to is twin. And so um, when you, when there's twinning traumas with two children, generally they're going to bring two children together. Um, kind of the, the develop emotional development, relational development of that child severely mal um, what would be the word, not malnourished, but uh, maladaptive this not you know operating in trauma and for whatever programming they're trying to get to stick it and, and it's not there's no identity that child has no identity from being you know for me when i experienced twinning traumas um i've been trafficked you know um a victim of satanic ritual abuse since being three days old just consistent uh rape and molestation and satanic ritual abuse and um, I, I tie all of these kind of military grade abuses with satanic ritual abuse with mind control to Diego Garcia. I always, you know, in my mind, see they were other areas. Diego Garcia is an island in the Indian Ocean that the UK government owns and the United States leases. And the coves around it are deep enough that a submarine can park underwater and you'd never know the submarine was there. Oh my God. So it's an island that's just kind of how it is. It has very deep coves right up against the shore. And I've got memories there of like under underwater laboratories and things like that. And the position of it being in the Indian Ocean, you've got Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia. Boom. You know, right. and it's that? strategic. Yeah, it's very strategically positioned. In like the 50s, the United Kingdom kicked out all of the indigenous individuals, made them refugees, relocated them, took it over and, and has leased it to the United States since. So I, I always equate like these military grade traumas to Diego Garcia, but there were many military bases involved um, in these traumas that I had experienced. Well, but with the twinning, they get the children to bond. So the individual, the, the, the girl that I was trying, they tried to twin me with, they gave us a puppy. And it was the first time like I'd ever gotten to play with a puppy. Now animal, you know, animal sacrifice and things like that, very common for them as well to allow the child to bond with an animal and then perform animal sacrifice and things like that to traumatize a child. And mm -hmm. so um, she and I were allowed to play with a puppy and kind of form a bit of a, a bond. Um, and from there- Can I ask um, Rachel, like what sort, yeah. of, 
what sort of age would you you, you have been at, at at this um at this stage just so we can kind of get a picture of that with I, the probably, programming? Uh, between four and seven. Yeah. Yeah. So young. Very I'm young. not sure exactly. Of yeah. Course. Very young. It, it gets very, hard. Very young. Yeah. Bef yeah. Yeah. Um, and so um, it was when my dad's brother, my uncle, was my handler. Um, and so, yeah, it would have been between ages four and seven. And he was um, the, he was the military connection, is that right? So that was he was. He was. Well, my dad country. had my dad had been a marine as well uh, before I was born. Um, my dad had been a marine, and but he was um, retired military. Um, he'd been a pilot before becoming a warrant officer. Um, as a helicopter pilot in Vietnam, he was a Green Beret for two tours in Vietnam. So. Um, yeah, but, um, I, what ended up like that, that little girl and I, there's not a lot of memories. I can remember like times we were part of experiments together and, uh, medical experiments and things like that, um, probably to try and like produce, um, what's the word, uh, astral projection and things like that reading each other's minds wow mm -hmm. and yeah, they do that like a lot that. with the twinning programming as well isn't it yeah so because of what they can't get if they can form a counterfeit identity between two individuals right and then in that unhealthy relational bond between two children they can try and put the programming in Mm. and so they then so they allow an attachment to form there's still trauma so it's still a trauma bonded relationship relational dynamic um and then um now with the could i just you know, ask with the trauma yeah. with the trauma bonding yeah. of relationship between mm -hmm. the two children that are being twins would you say that is because you're you know witnessing and feeling that pain that the other child is going through um or is it yeah and you're blamed of, for it right uh, because the trauma bonding yeah. is you're guilty for it That's trauma. Trauma. so they're yeah. abusing the other child and it's blaming your fault. you it's your fault that i have to do this to them yeah. because you're right it's like you can't understand your own pain because no one's acknowledged it taught yeah never even had like a band-aid put on my knee you know for a scraped knee and so um, for, for that, it's always the getting blamed. This is your fault. When, and so what they, they are trying to do, I believe, trying to do is distort your right and wrong. Yeah. Okay. So that, that, like, it, that contortion, that twist of the serpent of right and wrong, so that... I need to do bad things so they don't happen. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the base level lie of it is very emotionally reactive. And it's it's like when you, you hear of the mass shootings or things like that and, you know, you get a phone call and a dial tone and then and you are off with the program. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, you know, I think if this... At this day and age, like I've got a, I have a, a burn phone that's not tied to me. It's not tied to my name or my social security number. It's a prepaid phone um, that I use. So I still have a phone and I get a phone card every month, but I have security and that it's not tied to my social security number here in the U.S. But I still get spam calls yeah. that have dial tone. Wow. It's like how have they even and so I think them. at this point it's just like they're throwing a net to see who they can yeah what, you I, know, I that agree. net of chaos over our society. I'm sure for some they are tracking still to see what they're doing. But I think there's also like this net of how much chaos can we cause, you know. 
and knowing um, their agenda to activate, you know, all the sleepers out yeah. in the community. You know, yeah. there's figures that we see going through, you know, the media, mm-hmm. through what the politicians yeah. are saying, through all the colour programming, et cetera, in everything. Um, but th- that's really interesting what you're saying, just about the the way that the trauma bonding is used, you know, in those experiments and in those rituals. And I imagine, you know, from my experiences as well, like some children are more scared of or more fearful of, you know, being hurt themselves and then other children and this is where I was and I, I'm thinking that you would have been in this category as well the fear actually came from them um, wanting to hurt people that we loved or another child in front of us so I wouldn't be motivated it gets to the point when there's abuse it's kind of like there's abuse every day whatever is going to happen I'll get through it by going inside or or blacking it out but when it's an abuse of someone else that can really you know draw us into further programming um and there's always got to be this choice with programming as well so you know we can be abused etc but if unless they can get you to agree to go along with them for some reason the programming doesn't work and if it doesn't work by them hurting you the next thing is let's hurt someone else and see if that that yeah you know. that's exactly we have to come into agreement regardless of where we are in life and in age for any of the enemy's agendas to be effective we have to agree with them we have to come into agreement it's like you know the original sin in the garden the serpent doesn't go after adam who had walked with god longer and was the spiritual authority mm. because if you're a spiritual authority, you are the representation of God to the full he's given you. Not that I am to be the God of those that God's given me to minister to. I'm to be his representation of love and safety and stewardship and kingdom dominion. So in the garden, that's Adam. So his wife knows her husband, who's the spiritual authority, the son of God, first son of God, if you look at the genealogies and the book of Luke. So the serpent goes to his wife and produces the lie that challenges the character of God. That's the first thing the enemy does is get us to challenge the character of God with our thought process. Did God really say You can't eat that fruit. He's challenging the character. And then the wife's response, because she's not Eve yet till they're out of the garden. So the woman's response to him, well, no, God said we can't even touch that tree lest we die. So now she's not effectively battling the serpents in truth and the word of God. And so it's in the phases. And so Adam watches all of that go down because he was with her. Nothing happens to her for eating the fruit. So now he is doubting what God told him. And he partakes. And now they've both, where God had called them to be one flesh, they have now both eaten of the forbidden fruit. And they can't stay in the garden. And so there's so many misunderstandings of what is a spiritual authority? You know, what are we supposed to be as spiritual authorities? Who do we, you know, it's almost as if we, we see pastors that become pastors that maybe not ever really had a call to ministry, but they can sure talk and get the crowds. And if you can get the crowds, you can get the tithing. All and the wrong so reasons, right? all the wrong reasons be, because it's, it's a, it to be, a healthy spiritual authority, but parents are a spiritual authority as well. Automatic. Yeah. Parents are the first spiritual authority we will have. So when they are not walking in the truth of the kingdom of God restored through Jesus Christ and raising their children in those principles, there's going to be wounds created. Just automatic because we're not teaching truth. The enemy can come in, let alone if they're intentionally conceiving their children to produce further agents of the enemy and raise up further agents of the enemy's agenda, intentionally raising them in a kingdom of 
darkness. And so, you know, with these traumas and how they come in, I think the hardest thing for me, like for you, is I had blamed myself so much for causing hurts to others and looking at my past relationship patterns, blaming myself for things that were never, ever my responsibility for the other. You know, blaming myself for things where, and it created really unhealthy, you know, relationships repeatedly, um, very dangerous um, individuals that I continue to date and take the blame for their behaviors, allow them to blame me for their behaviors, right? Exactly. And so the other aspect that was even harder to heal from was when as a child other children would be killed and i'd survive and it was always staged in a way whether it was a emergency on their end of not or like we've got to move kids quickly which ones are we going to you know which ones are from a bloodline we have to save and which ones are, are the expendables and i cannot how would you ever could ever consider any trial to be expendable is beyond me. But there were several times, probably like five and six years old at different locations where it'd be a sudden move in the middle of the night. And, you know, there, there was one time that there were times some that I would be um, drugged like via IV by a military nurse and put in a storage crate, a military base, and flown on military aircraft. But there were also times that I'd be drugged and thrown in a duffel bag or a book bag, depending on, you know, how old I was in my size at the time. And so, you know, it'd be a quick, you know, um, injection or IV placement, anesthesia, you know, something to be moved at a great distance if needed. But they would kill the children they weren't moving and that was a much harder like survivor's guilt on top of feeling it's my fault when bad things happen to other people that survivor's guilt was very hard to to heal from the memories um were so intense that i had multiple altars kind of holding those Mm -hmm. memories for me that so then you know one of the frustrating things about the healing process um i'm not sure if you found this as well is when it was that difficult of a memory that different altars had to let, let go of it different aspects of my soul were affected by it to feel like i'm reprocessing it all over again i want to be like how have i done this enough already there's no. so there can be so many layers of the healing and you can think I mean it's happened to me I can I've been like oh yeah I've reintegrated that memory and then you know six months or 12 months later it's like actually there's a little bit more that you didn't have here you go yeah. um and you know that's it's really interesting how you mentioned that there can be multiple ulcers involved with you know holding a memory and that is a very common experience, especially with the really traumatic ones. And just as you were saying that, I was thinking to myself, most of the recollections I've had where I've had memories split into, you know, the the visuals are separate from the sounds, are separate from the feeling. They have been the severe traumas, not just of myself, but when there's been other children um, being being tortured in front of me. And that was obviously far more traumatic for me so it 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 was able to shatter that memory into more more places so that's that's a really you know pivotal thing I think that you've pointed out there for survivors to understand is there's so much for us to kind of just bring back together as well and with with God we can do that which is really amazing there's a there's a very um if you the depth or the layers or, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll relate that as well to like heart pillars. If we are going after a stronghold of the enemy within us, now this comes more from like an understanding of, of 
repetitive sin like addiction that we can't get free of. That would be considered a stronghold in our life, right? But we can also apply that concept of a stronghold to within us, like an emotional space, right? What is it that I am, am stuck on that I keep dissociating? Or what is it within me that I that that um, I'm needing to reprocess this memory with different alters? What is it in well one we have coming to a place of acceptance through the blood of Jesus, it will heal. And and that's almost a bit of just like stubborn surrender of like God's got me and God's got this. And so he will heal this. And if this is part of that, then, okay, here we go, God, you know, <laughs> uh, there, there are, there are that, that, that kind of hold up that platform. It says if the, the enemy through these attacks against children has, he turns our soul into a satanic altar. Now, that does not mean victims of satanic ritual abuse are satanic. Please understand, like anyone watching this, he, the, the enemy, because of the agreements of our parents and our forefathers, while we are children and under their spiritual authority, it's their agreements. Okay. Then the enemy has access to us because of generational agreements already made. That our soul almost becomes this this altar of the enemy due to the repeated abuses of satanic ritual abuse because that's what he is turning us into as children. He, we're not the how the witches and the warlocks like we're not children to them. For mm -hmm. however twisted a purpose and statement that is just to, to utter, we are an end to the means of furthering them getting more power, them using their spiritual abilities for the kingdom of darkness. We are victims in that. So when we come to know our identity restored through the blood of Jesus Christ, we're no longer victims. We are now co-heirs. We are now adopted. And then we draw to the cross when we have an a, a, a need that we recognize because God's given us through his son and becoming a, this, this a claiming this adoption status. Like we are given then an internal perspective. And so even in the intensity of what we've experienced, what is healing in that journey in process, we have, an eye above the current situation that grows into faith to be able to be like, this is where I am now. And again, that comes back to a level of like faithful acceptance. God will heal me. It's almost like the woman with the issue of blood in the book of Luke that had had an issue for 12 years, had seen the physicians, no one could help her. She hears the master is walking by. And just grabs the hem of his cloak. If that's all the faith that you have is to reach and grab the hem of his cloak, that's not. Just don't let go. <laughs> hold on. Stay. Hold on with that <laughs> hem. Because it's enough. Yeah. It is. I think yeah. that belief, you know, that, that walk of faith and, you know, it's that first opening to believing that you can be healed with with mm -hmm. god and with jesus is such a huge step for survivors just you know it can be such a small opening to start with but once you know, we can have that belief it just allows you know his goodness to flow into our lives and and often for survivors we've never had a, a positive relationship a father a family you know what i mean right. so you know it take it slowly like it takes time to trust and I know that was the biggest thing with me I was like can I trust you like right. what's what's going on here but you know it, my walk has just been like every step of the way Jesus has been with me and has you know the Holy Spirit has just been the most incredible guide and teacher and has allowed me to do this completely with God and me um you know, building this beautiful relationship. So 
It's incredible. The more I draw to him in prayer, I could all in the like in the really intense healing that first like 18 months as memory started to become restored. I'd always kind of like looking back, anytime a memory was healed, then the Lord would show me where he was in that event with me. I have a lot of memories of the lion of Judah with his paw over my forehead weeping while roaring at them to stop and promising that protect that memory until he had me to safety to heal it. Just that realization. I was chatting to a survivor last night, actually. And, you know, just having that realization that we were never alone, that God was with us. And that is why we are here, you know, and we're healing and, you know, I'm so grateful for that and you know, I never take that for granted like not after seeing like what we were just discussing that there's so many children that aren't getting this chance to heal at the moment and it is it is tough there are days it's just like why me like not another layer today come on but you know we have the opportunity to heal and you know the opportunity to feel joy and to have trust again and build healthy relationships and find God. And you know, it, it, it breaks my heart thinking of the children, you know, that were, that were lost in those, lost in that evil and never got the chances that we are now, Rachel. And, you know, that's a real, you know, that's a fire in my belly to keep going is to be a voice for them as well. Same. You know, I think of like what the Lord's promised me as a mother, and, uh, you know, there's so many women that have waited decades to have their children restored from the cults. You know, so many women with stories like mine that have just waited decades. And in. Oh, am I good to share this? OK, the Lord's specific promise to me as a mother about restoration of my children is that our restoration is going to be what shakes the foundations in the spiritual realms of the Mormon occult. Mm-hmm. And I am just fine punching along in prayer as <laughs> long as I need to, to take down the Mormons. Not like I want them to repent. Not all of them can because they've come in agreement. And, and I believe there's hybrids intermingled amongst them at this point. But for those that, are not Nephilim and are able to repent. I my heart is that they receive Jesus and have the humility to accept any societal criminal charges that may come for their behaviors. We have to answer to both sides still, you know, right? We can't, oh, I got Jesus now, you don't have to put me in jail. But you know, I want to take like I feel just such an unction from the Lord to take down the Mormons. Yeah. you know and it's, to, it's you about know. the it's about the system isn't it it's about shutting down yeah. the institution I, yeah it's not about Shut the people, down the system. Individual, you know what i mean it's just like closing yeah. this evil you know yeah. disgusting demonic institution that has been targeting mm-hmm. vulnerable people and children for, for yeah. decades yeah and the mormons have been doing it for centuries for yeah. centuries they have this place in the state of missouri in the united states and you can look it up it's called I think they call it like Adam on die almond. And it's got all of these stone altars all around it in their lives. They teach that angels are going to come to these sacred grounds and teach them the last teachings they need for the last days before the return of Jesus. You and I know full well what altars are used for in Podunk, mm-hmm. Missouri in the backwoods of <laughs> United States, like that's not holy nor sacred. It's demonic. And then try and tell everybody that they're the altars that Adam built when he was removed from the garden to offer sacrifice on. Well, yeah, read your Bible a little better, you know, like thing, isn't it? there it was a flood really after. Need, <laughs> really need to know the word of God at the moment because it's just yeah, so, it's so it you know, is so woman. important. I was just going to say the Mormons are so tricky too because, you know, I didn't know a lot about them and I'm so grateful for you for, 
you know, giving us that overview with your first interview. And, you know, here in Australia, the Mormons are kind of just almost giggled at, they're laughed at, like they, they play this kind of like we're a little bit silly and, you know, ridiculous, like it's not too serious. But underneath all of that, um, it's it's horrendous. It's absolutely horrendous what they're up to. I mean, most most people in Australia were probably the only thing they would know about Mormons is, you know, they've got like this funny underpants issue. That would be like the greatest knowledge. that right. is. That's here. generally for most of them. And it's deliberate. You know, right? I, it reminds me of the Shriners, like the, how they yeah. have their little, their little clown cars. Mm-hmm. They really put themselves out there as just being like a little bit weird and, you know, doing silly things. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, this is like e- an evil child but sacrifice. If you, if you talked, like that seems to be the, the ploy yeah. of excusing bad behavior oh they're just a little weird that's right. they're not making bad decisions or they're just a little off it's that gaslighting they, yeah. they're setting themselves up to gaslight society so, i talked yeah. to, i had a i was walking home the other day from the laundromat and and i see two mormon missionaries knocking on a door right they had an appointment they're there to meet with someone and holy spirit's like mm, hang out for this one and so I tucked myself kind of along the road behind a, like there was a fence. So they, I could see when they exited the driveway, but they wouldn't see me like staring them down or anything. I didn't want to feel threatening to them. And so I just hung back for a minute, praying and seeking the Lord and what to do. And they're walking back to their car and I walk up to them and they're like, hey, what's going on? And I'm like, <laughs> it's hard when doors get slammed in your face, isn't it? And they're like, yeah, yeah. And we talk back and forth and they're like, do you know anything about Mormonism? And I'm like, yeah, I know a good bit about I Mormonism. Know who you're talking to. And, um, and they're like, really? And I'm like, yes, I was raised Mormon. And all of my brothers have served missions. I've been through the temple and received their ordinances of the temple. And they're like, I said, and now I'm a pastor because I found truth. And when I said that, I could see their altars yeah. in their eyes, in their eye gates. I could see the altars. Like, what do I do with that information? Because when you're that traumatized and someone comes at you in love and truth, you do not have an ability to receive it. It's just like if I went outside in the desert here on the ground and I turn on the water hose, I'm going to wash all the dirt away because there's no moisture to hold the dirt and so where we have become in america at least i don't know in australia um let's chime in on this you know altar call and i say a sinner's prayer and then i've got that get out of hell free card in my wallet and a singular experience defines my salvation from that moment on well that's a falsity so we expect you to you know dunked and done you know just get them baptized and and they're good no, <laughs> like there's discipling and deliverance the daily and maturing and, and there's a whole process to continue. So I just had that little exchange with them. And I and when I said I found truth and I'm a pastor now. Wow. There I could see the altars in both of them. Just what do I do with that information? Which one of us absorbs that? And that's the thing, is, you know, when you drop that up. kind of truth and it's confronting all of their religious Everything. beliefs, you know. And these are like 19-year-old that, kids. You're like triggering, you know, probably yeah. the demons that were holding in that programming. Mm-hmm. And that's what we see is, you know, when people dissociate, it's it's just because they, they actually can't hold that truth that you've given them that it just gets knocked out they just blank out something else yeah. checks in for a while and it's gone um so that's that's really interesting that that they had that response isn't it yeah and then I was, I was talking to a co-worker this week and she's um she's a retired police officer from one of the towns around here um I don't want to say which one but she's she's from the the valley out here in Phoenix and retired police officer and she worked the majority of her career in children's crimes. And so I was able to share very openly with her and I have in the past of like things I've been through and what I've experienced. And she goes, you know, we're a lot of the law enforcement agencies are aware that the Mormons are 
connected to all of the international human trafficking rings. We just can't, we just can't, we know it. We can't prove it. Wow. Yeah. Or yeah. You in charge, doesn't it? And so I told her, I said, yeah, like I was trafficked internationally by my mom and dad through their connections. And she goes, you are not the first woman to tell me. And I know you probably won't be the last. Wow. What a frustrating situation to be in, right? To to know something right. you're not able to do anything. And I know that happens a lot here in Australia. Like, I mean, look, there is a lot of Freemason cops here that are very bad and part of the system. But I mean, when there is a cop that's trying to help a survivor or a child, they'll just get yeah. their case canned. They'll get moved. They, they'll just get shut off the entire thing. So that, that there's just this kind of ceiling of power that is just shutting down so much. And it it's so frustrating at this stage. You know, it's like, like where, where I work, you know, I work for the, one of the largest mental health care providers in the state of Arizona. Um, and we intentionally work with the demographics of society that no one wants to the addicted, the homeless, you know, we have all of these different resources that we can provide them and teams they can work with and, you know, medical clinics that pair with psychiatric clinics and are combined and, and integrated care and, and things like that. And it's like walking among some of the bravest Good Samaritans I've ever met in my life. I see more compassion and bravery and really just like valiancy for the community from their lives and hearts just as my colleagues than I do going to a church service and talking to other Christians, which breaks, which just breaks my heart. Like I've got these amazing individuals that are on fire for the community and helping those that no one wants to help. And then I go to a church service mm -hmm. and you know, they want a, a few praises and hallelujah and a 20 minute sermon and we're out within the hour. So the next one can come in. <laughs> And it is like, like fast, fast yeah. service, isn't it? So nice. Yeah. What a mess. Yes. What an absolute yeah. mess. But that's that's why we're so lucky, Rachel. We have survivors like you stepping up to, you know, create solutions. And it, it is so lacking. It's so lacking in our yes. church that survivors cannot even be heard or understood. Well, it's, it's like I want to, I, it's not the timing for it yet, but I do want to create like a, right, um, a foundation of, of types that when a church or community becomes prepared and aware of satanic ritual abuse and wants to work, because it takes a community to help another community heal. We have to recognize that. Right? So when they want to come together and be able to come in and what are they already doing? You don't have to teach them how to do what I do. What are they already doing and how can they adjust what they're doing for the Lord to come in and transform an existing ministry or existing ministries to help survivors of satanic ritual abuse? I just am in prayer all the time waiting for the different addiction ministries that I'm connected to to come to me and say, how do we recognize when you are dealing, when we have someone that is a victim of satanic ritual abuse, a lot of the church wants to be aware that it happens, unaware of the frequency of it. I know one ministry in particular that I was more connected to initially early on. And just in like the few hundred or so people that I'm friends with on Facebook, because I'm very minimal on social media, I know of three three women that I've met through their ministry that need to heal in the ways I have that need to heal in the ways I have with the Lord that are from these families, <clears throat> but haven't yet separated from their family. So the memories can safely start being restored, you know, and, and things like that. And the churches and so how do you, you know, so we just what, get them sober and leave them in the rest of, of whatever their life is that they can't, have clarity of mind and explain their behaviors. We've got to start like a dear, dear friend of mine. He has a slogan as a pastor, go for the souls and go for the worst ones. Well, go for those that have a mental health diagnosis, go for them. 
you know, because the majority of us had a mental health diagnosis that everybody wanted to medicate away, you know, now, and I'm not like, and there's still a process to get pulled out of, of all of that. So like you and I have talked about this, like my, the altered personalities for me completely healed. I'm fully delivered. I'm not yet fully delivered from psychiatric medications. I still take a few psychiatric medications and continue working in my healing to get to a place to need fewer. I take two every day. I just need like, I think they're giving me like 13 a day, different medications. I remember going to the pharmacy to have like two big bags. How in the heck can 13 psychiatric medications? You just think how Mm -hmm. many years of abuse and programming and trauma did you endure? And you've had just three years, just three years with walking with God and like you've healed so much. We also can't, it would be lovely, but we can't, (laughs) sorry, four, but we can't expect it to happen overnight either like no. there's, there's so much and that's, to heal. Yeah. So many layers of us to heal as well so but people you know there's so many so many demonic contortions of truth that the church has purchased has purchased and swallowed and is now speaking forth you know the excrement of that purchase and swallowing and so um that's the kindest way I'll say it, but and there's so it's, many. Yeah, it's a people that suffer. Control, like I have a, I have a, a woman I'm getting to know that is working on a book of all of her different friends that have gone to healing ministries and been abused. And she's like, it's the slowest book to write because I am then so saddened to hear that they go to a healing or deliverance ministry and leave with a deeper wound the the amount of abuse that's accepted within the church now that's just how they are but the, in the same breath would say well you know homosexuality is a sin mm. and it's that you know but in the gay community they say this is just how i am and then they look at the religious and can see their sins both sides need I the lord exactly. jesus himself said at the sermon on the mount unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. So we have to, like, in the healing process, it's learning to just refocus. You know, Paul talks about um, capturing our thoughts. It's that refocus. All right, back on the cross. Praise and worship and prayer. Receiving baptism of Holy Spirit so that he can wrap up the altars that want to trigger behaviors from other altars because you know there are those within the networks the networks of altars that they are demonically assigned and programmed in there to like poke at the other altars from within so when we receive baptism of holy spirit we can pray that holy spirit wrap himself around those altars through the healing process so they can no longer interfere and we can say that prayer when we need to and ask that the lord come in and keep the our own aspects of our soul mm. we're i mean we're, we we are such intricately woven creations of abba father and we have this mindset of the world of of its like do we have to go and do and if i do and so healing you want it to be like a check market sometimes you know Mm. god calls us to be to be still and know him very true and sometimes just being silence is when i have the most incredible healings and that was so foreign to me like to not do anything and not be talking or asking or praying it's just like to mm-hmm. actually be in silence is so beautiful and I, I love what you were saying before like I think you know we can get so confused and so deceived by you know what the church puts out in the lies the deceit and you know we think that it's all done when we we are saved by Jesus or or come come back and you know it is such a process of renewing our minds of you know we've had a lifetime of being filled with the devil's lies like it ta- it takes time to fill ourselves 
with God's truth and let that, it kind of has to percolate through, you know, and I'm still at the very beginning of my journey. So you know, I can only speak with where I am now as a survivor after spending the last two years healing with, with Jesus. I can't imagine where I'm going to be in five years time because I can't even look back two years and go, whoa, like, I can't believe that I've healed so much in two years. You know, the other 40 years of my life when I was like trying to heal, you know, so many things, it wasn't doing anything. Just scratching the surface. Yeah, I would I would love to ask your opinion on, um, you know, we were talking about the twinning, twinning traumas where children are mm-hmm. being experimented on or abused together. And a lot of that was around the psychic parameters of, you know, they were, they were doing things like telepathy where people can actually communicate um, without, without words from mind to mind. And I, I'd love to know what, what you feel about this. Cause I know a lot of researchers and, and people that are speaking out now that were ex programmers actually see that, you know, those so-called gifts like telepathy were you know demonic influences and it kind of makes sense if they were doing that in a twinning uh experiment or ritual that potentially they were maybe even trying to attach to the same demonic principality or demonic force and then that would be some sort of spiritual connection that those two children hold together i i just like thought i'd ask drink. because you've got that kind of experience yourself in your history yeah no, that's a good question. And it ties some stuff together for me. You know, I, I always felt that any of the children, like there was one child they tried to twin me to, and I felt like she was a distant cousin. Well, so, like looking back now, I feel like she was a distant cousin. So there would have been some some blood relation between us, you know, and that is very much what it was, is, is like trying to... So... Sin opens doors into the soul, right? Whether it's sin that we commit or sin committed against us. We know that from Cain before he kills Abel, he's warned by the Lord. You got to check yourself. Sin is crouching at your door. Okay. And so with these traumas in the in the spiritual realms, they can, they're trying to open doors. And so if they can kind of put the same door In both children, then the familiar spirits that are already assigned to that bloodline, that the bloodline has made agreements to have as guardians of the bloodline, things like that, you know, then I think absolutely they're trying to like open a door for that child. Because you can have generational curses where like the same bad things keep happening, but that is... That is not the same as a generational agreement or a generational covenant. And so you can have generational curses where everybody ends up divorced or everyone's first husband dies or something like like that. Um, But this is like intentional demonic access to that child. Not just for events around the child, like in the book of Job, when the enemy is given access to clear out and destroy everything but Job's life. You know, but specific access to the soul of the child, because if the demonic, if there's demonic possession, then the demonic, it can can, can kind of direct the will of just like um, when Jesus would rebuke demons, when parents would bring their children to the Lord and ask for help, he's demon possessed and sometimes he's thrown into the fire, things like that, you know. We, 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 for, for the church becoming so stuck on preaching instead of operating with Holy Spirit, we'd rather talk about him than partner with him most of the time as Christians. We're not walking in our authority to understand, like, how do you really minister to the depths of problems within our, it's easy to preach against the problems in the depth of our society. How do you like um, my friends that within the church that are not charismatic and don't have baptism of Holy spirit and cannot pray in tongues, they can look at the Pentecostals around them. And they agree with me when I say that Pentecostals and charismatics are some of the most emotionally unintelligent individuals I've ever met. It's an aspect of pride. I've got Holy spirit. I don't need to be self-aware. 
you know, God justifies me. I can do what I want. And, and there's still selfishness and extreme pride. Wow. You know, and then I look at these individuals, though, that are not have not yet received baptism of Holy Spirit. And I'm just like, you know, Lord, how do I like God has to give them that desire to receive Yeah, But when we partner with Holy Spirit, you know, I at work, I can build professional relationships in a secular capacity amongst individuals that. Uh, it's like a gentleman two weeks ago overdosed and I he had to give him Narcan and do CPR. Now I'm praying the whole time, you know, and I'm battling for him and he survives and is back at the shelter I work at. And then two, three weeks later, I'm having to deliver consequences to his actions for drinking alcohol on site, which is against the rules. Can't be drugs and alcohol on site. And he cannot, he cannot stay for whatever, you know, whatever. We put him on like a timeout from the shelter for a day or two, you know, oh, depending on where they're at. It. Yeah. And so those were some hard emotions for me to go from one extreme of, I just saved your life to three weeks That's later, great. I'm having to tell you, you cannot be here for a few days. And he's cussing me out in his drunkenness, you know, and, and so but none of what, it's not about me. My life today, for any Christian, when we accept Jesus, our life is not our own. It was bought with a price. And we teach that, you know, there's a lot of mis, mis teachings and poor teachings about what water baptism is. And it's symbolic of dying to self and raising in that resurrection with Jesus Christ. But we want to say it's symbolic of the changes he's already working in us, you know. And so there's just different teachings and all of these things. We've got to come together, not necessarily in agreement of one theology or any of that, in unity, in unity. Which means the things that I am good at are not going to be the things that you are good at or that someone else is good at. But we come together to meet the needs of those around us and the greatest and, and most pained in our society right now in the most dire of need are the drug addicts and the homosexuals and the domestic violence victims and the human trafficking victims because in their suffering is an aspect of humility that Jesus can come into where a proud heart wouldn't let the Lord in. Oh, that's so true. And it's it? going to be people walking in, in healing of the hardest of things that mm -hmm. inspires those around them to deal with whatever is keeping them from walking in healing from the hardest of things. Because the answer, regardless of your denomination, regardless of your theologies, Jesus is salvation and he heals all. It's that simple. Isn't it? It's a process. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. And you are just such an incredible example of Jesus's healing in, in such a short period of time. Like look at, look at your life change and, you know, you're just starting to see, you know, God's will start flowing into your life after, you know, everything that you were born into. So it's incredible. And I, I would love for you to share just as, as we, you know, begin to finish up, because I know you've, you've got a head on, um, just if you could let people know about your daily prayer and what you're doing there and also your deliverance service for January, because that's really exciting. Yes. So daily prayer is something the Lord placed on my heart to start doing. Um, it's usually like a 10 to 15 minute prayer. Sometimes they're a little longer depending on Holy Spirit, but I pray the word first over satanic ritual abuse survivors and human trafficking survivors. Anyone could benefit from the prayer time, uh, but they're specifically for human trafficking and satanic ritual abuse survivors. Um, I pray the word first and then proceed from there. Lord's given me some really good ones, like how to calm when the rapid, when the cycle, when the altars are rapid cycling, that was a powerful one. I like just wanted to start smiling when I realized what Holy Spirit was doing. Um, he gave me, he's, he's had me do a few others. And it's not like there's, I don't prepare for it at all. You, I just sit down and ask the Lord, which one am I praying? And he gives me the scripture to start with. 
Yeah. And and then I just surrender that time to him. And so there's no um, structure beyond, you know, I pray the word first. It's all Holy Spirit led. And that led very quickly to a desire to want to do prophetic prayer ministry. Uh, so I prayed about a time and a day and the Lord gave me to that, gave me that first. So January 7th for the new year at 7 p.m. Mountain Standard Time in the United States. I am going to do a live prophetic prayer. Um, and that is going to be live on my mm -hmm. YouTube channel. I was trying to sort it out. Like I could do a zoom link or, you know, you know, some of the other telegram or um, there's another one I use. Uh, I could do like a group, but then I thought about it. I'm like, but that leaves exposure that anyone could gain access. And so I was trying to pray about what to do and keep everyone that wanted to participate safe. And it just made immediate sense. Like, oh, I'll go live on YouTube and I'm announcing it ahead of time. And if someone wants to comment or something, a specific need for prayer, you know, they can, um, but their face isn't exposed. Their name is not exposed. I'm not going to be asking for anyone to put in their location or any of that like others do. In fact, I'm going to ask that you not, um, that you just come to receive. The hardest thing in healing is learning to receive. And that's a different aspect of faith. But we just need the faith to receive because all of the promises come true in a walk with the Lord. Maybe not all at once, but he's just waiting for us to be to be ready with our arms open and strong enough to receive the bounty of blessings he has for us. I think Jen, the, I mean, both with your daily prayer, which I love, I think you just cover some beautiful topics for survivors, you know, that other people doing deliverance wouldn't have any idea of, you know, like talking about cycling altars and, you know, how to, how to release trauma, how to, how to forgive God if you're angry with God. Like these are the kind of things that don't, get covered in normal ministry so they're really beautiful little prayers that you can you know start building into your practice every day and I just think what a what a beautiful event for January like you know especially for survivors that maybe you know haven't haven't tried deliverance before you know rather than just watching a video you can join something that's live so we're all connected in some way and you know experience that and well and his deliverance is more than just freedom from the demonic yeah. Deliverance is freedom from what the demonic did to me. It's not just that I was demon possessed. I was shattered from the actions of, of others. I never went out intentionally to yoke myself to the demonic. And I did make handshakes at 18 years old in the trickery of the Mormons, because that's what I was taught I needed to do. But beyond that, I didn't go for higher levels of, of witchcraft like others in my family have. I always tried to know the Lord and just built me a little different than the rest of them, I guess. But, but yeah, I mean, if we're angry with God, God already knows we're angry with him. <laughs> but if, I mean, <laughs> like, if there is a sin pattern that we're caught in, God already knows that we are. And confession's an aspect of repentance, and we don't teach well the beauty of repentance. And we, you know, have, have such close-mindedness within the church. You just shouldn't. Uh, stupid word shouldn't well i did so how do i fix it now you know like <laughs> oh, you should have done that okay. you know, it's, it's easy thank you for back. letting me know after the fact this is where my life is today can you help me know how to bring the lord into this these level of wounds and you know that just highlights again like i feel like so much of the conventional church at the moment is just not walking in enough authority themselves for whatever reason, mm -hmm. whether it's saying don't read their Bibles or they're just not actually putting anything into practice themselves, but they're just not walking with enough authority to really minister and heal survivors because, you know, you're talking about people that have 
went through horrific spiritual, emotional, sexual, physical abuse, often for decades, huge demonic attachments that have been passed down family lines deliberately, often genetic manipulations, Nephilim breeding programs. You know, I actually think most people in church are just like, there's no, I'm going there. But the beauty is, you know, there's survivors that are coming up that are ready to take all this on. Like, it's like we have already yeah, we're the King David's this. Right I'm not now. scared of it. Like, get out. <laughs> like, women like you and I are the King Davids right now. They're like Goliath and. What more can mind. they do to me? I have Jesus yeah. today and I know how I know. to speak his name over situations. So, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I've had those types of conversations with friends where they're like getting caught up in what's going on and they're trying to vent to me, and I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, who, like who do you know today that you did it three years ago? You know, and so I think it's like I we have it. such a, a you're right, it's like this focus of well, great, grow your faith, God can grow your faith, God. It's the trials of our faith. Like Paul talks about, like these things happen. And if we walk through it in faith, we receive purification and God shows us different places of ourselves to surrender more to him. But this concept that salvation is a singular event for the rest of our lives to experience heaven on the other. No, no. Like my salvation, I carry in my heart. I carry a piece of heaven in my heart today and i have that to share with others around me and my salvation is determined where i am at in that final breath and so for some of us that final breath is going to be like the criminal on the cross next to jesus lord have mercy on me And the Lord is saying, I'll see you in paradise. For some of us, it's going to be like Peter that receives his redemption and a breakfast on the beach with the Lord after denying him three times. And for some of us, it will be like Judas that are so distraught with our own actions that we never return to say, Lord, please forgive me. Now, whether Judas could have been forgiven or not, clearly I'm not getting into that theology, but it's a symbolic (laughs) reference right now. That's another story. That's it. (laughs) Oh, I would love would you have a prayer to share with us today yes. Rachel? I would love to yes. see monthly people can experience that with you as well yeah absolutely uh, I'm just going to read a few verses in the prayer uh, from Matthew uh, chapter 18 Lord thank you thank you oh thank you Lord um If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Lord, your word also says that the face of angels minister to the little ones always look on the Father. Lord, thank you for your ministering angels to each of us that we may not see, may not always be aware of, but Lord, your word says that they are there. Lord, I call forth ministering angels in the name of Jesus over survivors of satanic ritual abuse and human trafficking, Lord, that you place a guard around them and continue to rescue them, Lord, continue to bring them forth, Father God, to a healing journey with you, continue to grow the voices of survivors as we bring awareness, Lord, as we fight alongside you and in agreement with what your word says. We just thank you for the victory and the finished work on the cross. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. It was beautiful. What a what a powerful verse. You know, I think it's so important for us to keep that in mind at the moment as well. Is you know, 
God has a plan and God has judgment coming and, you know, God, God has always been here protecting us too. So it's just, yeah, a beautiful, a beautiful one to reflect on. But thank you so much, Rachel, for, for everything you're doing. I will put Rachel's YouTube link in the video description and the link to her book. So if you want to join for the daily prayer, it's really easy. You'll just be able to click through and we are so, we're just so grateful for you sharing and, you know, educating us on on the Mormon cult and creating these beautiful solutions for survivors. So God bless you. Thanks. Bless you as well. Thank you so much, Gabby.